Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Andy Campbell to Superstar Speakers. Good How evening, doing, mate. Sir? I'm all right, mate. Yeah, thank you. Good, good, good. Um, I've seen you've been doing quite a bit of podcasting over lockdown and beyond. How are you finding it? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's something obviously very different. Uh, we started our championship show, uh, Ace Podcast Nation, in the, uh, at the start of the season. Uh, and I think lockdown, to be honest, has been the best thing since has happened to, uh, <laughs> to the show. Because it gives us, give us a bit of time to focus on something and, and just to talk about uh, just just normal. All, I think all the football and I think a generation of football and things uh, and something that we enjoy talking about. And because, as I say, coronavirus can just go to another level for me and you know what I mean and we can start to talk about what we all love and what we enjoy and if that's future football to to, to whatever level it is but I think uh, reminisce about old football you know what I mean you just can't beat it really yeah there's very much a nostalgia feeling with old football like when you're a 96 yeah. has been on and it's yeah. still oh. drawing in viewers <laughs> like yeah well this guy Mowbray a guy's been my hero all the way through lockdown because he's done uh, all the FA Cup games he's uh, he's done all games. I, I, what did I watch the other day? Liverpool against Arsenal, uh, the last game of the season, Anfield, where Arsenal beat them 2 0. And yeah. Mickey Thomas scored their last minute winner. And uh, just, it's just, it's it's the kind of football that I was brought up on with my dad. And um, and just, it, it obviously still plays a, a huge role. It's like the music you brought up on, isn't it, as a kid, that you always remember the words and you always remember the memories. And it's just, exactly it never that. goes away, really. Never goes away. Well, it's that thing of like, um, I was doing this at this time. I always remember you're, me time, and you were yeah. of similar ages. So you're a 96. Yeah. I was in my teenage years and it was just yeah. like, football was amazing. And you're watching it again. Yeah. I watched yeah. the um, Gaza at the Golden Goal and my heart was still in my mouth thinking he was going to yeah. do it. It was like 20 yeah, odd years back. Right? The thing is, though, every time I watch it and you and you watch it and you watch your studs go over the ball and you think, you know what I mean? He, 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 we couldn't have been any closer to that Golden nah. Goal to go, to go to the final and... Uh, is even his goal against um, uh, against Scotland and um, obviously the, the four goals against Holland. You know, what I mean, it just makes your your hair stand up on your neck and gets you excited. You know, what I mean, the, 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 it's exactly what you said. It's about that that you remember where you were. Same as I remember hiding behind my pillows when um, Stuart Pearce and Chris Waddle missed the penalties oh. against Germany in in, 19, in Italian ninety. You know that, and and you know, I mean, the the the, the haunt you those memories. But at the same yeah. time, I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to watch it because it's. Just makes you realise that football was even still, but was an, an amazing thing. And has had a huge impact on on all our lives. Absolutely, absolutely right. I mean, in the jobs that we're doing right now, we're both talking about football for a living, yeah. and it's you now that's the boyhood dream, isn't it? <laughs> that's yeah. okay. Well, of course. And the thing is, though, I think um, football is played uh, all over the world. It's you know, what I mean, it's a game for everybody at every level, and. Everyone's got their own memories, their own uh, their own opinion of it, really. And I think that what makes it even more special that not two people's opinions are the same on players' games, um, and and just it's just it's just a great talking point. And you it's know, man, I just hope we can get. You know, I just hope we can get to a, get back to that um, that point you know, and have supporters because supporters for me, and I've said all along, football's nothing without supporters. And you know, what I mean, imagine the goals that you, you put on the video there. Imagine my goals without people being there, being able to watch. You. It wouldn't have been the same, and, um, the and I just goal told in the playoffs. Imagine that silent. I know. Well, it, well, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. Have, it wouldn't have had a, a huge impact on me uh, as much as it did, and, um, and the memories, what people tell me about, and yeah. my first goal at the Riverside for Middlesbrough, and um, and it, it, I remember uh, my first full game at, at Liverpool in front of the cop. You know what I mean? Full uh, for Ian Rush's last game. Imagine that with no fans. It just wouldn't have made. Uh, it wouldn't have been as special as it was. So you know what I mean? Fans have have played. A, a, a bigger role than, than I ever thought looking back in my career. And the reality is, I mean, I agree with every single point you made. The reality is you're all fans as well. Like every yeah. professional footballer, right up from your David Beckhams to your Ronaldos, are still fans of football. And that's the that's what unites us all. That's what we've all got in common. We're all fans of good football. Yeah, that, and, and, and I think that's a good thing. You know what I mean? Regardless who we, who we support, who our favourite player is, where we live, that we're united by one thing, and that's football, and we all want football back. But we we also we live great memories. You know what I mean? There's yeah. there's heartache from all our football clubs from from years gone by. And there's also some good memories as well. And you know what I mean? If it wasn't for those heartaches, I'll be you know what I mean you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't appreciate the good times and and vice versa. And and I think that's the that's just the, the joys of being a football fan because yeah you, you know what I mean yes yeah you take Man City you, you, yes they've they've got all this money and they're in the Champions League and they've won titles but. They were in League One not so long ago, you know what I mean, and yeah. and they nearly didn't get past Gillingham in the playoffs. So you know, I, mean, I haven't looked back that far, and and it's just a, it's just a, it's just a memory of being a football fan. 
It's just it fabulous. Great. And the thing is, it leads us nicely on to what is the big talking point at the moment, because football is coming back. Like on the 17th yeah. of June, the Premier yeah. League's coming back. And I believe the week after the FA Cup is coming back. It's like, yeah. or it might be two weeks after. What do you yeah. reckon to like this this whole situation that we're in? Um, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because when people are losing their lives, it's for me it was a no-brainer to um, just to, just to hold out and postpone. You know, I don't I don't know what the rush was to uh, to cancel uh, certain yeah. leagues, and I also don't know what the rush was to, to to rush it back in certain countries. You know, I mean, Germany have obviously gone back. For me, the season had to be finished because there was too much invested. There was too much invested in every league. You know, what I mean, the, the league too. I feel so sorry for those footballers who've and chairman and managers and fans who've who've who paid all that money and invested so much in the season that, and they ain't going to get a reward. Um, Liverpool have to win the league. Yeah. Um, Le- Leeds United and West Bromwich Albion have to have the opportunity to get to the Premier League. You know what I mean? It's just it is the way of the world. And if if next season doesn't happen, then so be it. But this season has got to finish because we're we're three quarters away. Full. There's nine games left. You know what I mean? These nine yeah. games have got to finish it, it, because I look at the bottom three. You know what I mean? I, I look at being a Middlesbrough fan, ex Middlesbrough player. Middlesbrough could go down if if the if the season is finished. But I think that they deserve the opportunity to, to prove to every football fan around the world that they're good enough to stay up. And in those nine games, I hope they do, because if the season was voided, they would have stayed up. Because points per game, they would have stayed up. If the league was voided, they would have stayed up. So as a football fan and ex middle player, I'm taking a risk and putting my neck on the line saying that they will stay up. But I think they've got to prove that and, and, and earn the divine right. Like Liverpool have got to get over the line properly instead of being handed something which, which wasn't good and proper. Yeah, it's right because you really, like we said about what's so good about football, is you really don't know how they're going to react to the pressure that they're under. Like Villa could save themselves if they just dig yeah. deep and get done, couldn't they? And like yeah. Leeds, I don't think Leeds could blow it, but it's not, no. you know what I mean? It's not defined in for what it is yet. And there's a lot of money yeah. riding on that. Well, of course, it was, yeah. And I think everyone's, everyone deserves that opportunity. You know, I, mean, I know supporters won't be there to, to celebrate those kind of moments, but they'll be watching on TV and they'll be celebrating with the, with family and um, and being able to, you know, I mean, do obviously things like this and Zoom calls and, and celebrate in different ways. But I just think footballers, they deserve to finish the season. There's too much invested effort, um, uh, mental uh, fatigue, uh, 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 physical fatigue. So I think that it's right that, that they've been able to finish. I don't, I don't know what the rush is. You know what I mean? There's no... For me, we could have waited a little bit longer and, uh, and yeah. got a vaccine and, 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 and made sure it was all safe and, and potentially got fans back in uh, or some fans back in um, to, 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 uh, to make it a little bit different because, I, you know what I mean, I, I'm, I'm the same as everyone. I wanted football back and then I watched the Brushy Dortmund Schalke game and yes, I enjoyed the football because it was nice to see a competitive game, but the atmosphere was just so surreal. I don't know what I expected and I got shot down a little bit on social media that what did he expect with no fans going to be there? I don't know what he expected because I've never uh, watched a game with no fans and I've, and without, without well, a Champions League maybe is with, with no fans because there's, there's the reason behind it but this was different. This is because it had to be and, and I don't know what I expected, I'll be honest. So I was, I was excited but then let down, disappointed, still confused at the same time. But then I wanted more. It was like a, it was like a sixth sense, really. That I, I, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what I wanted, but then I wanted more of it. It's because you're used to it, isn't it? I always find that, that the difference when you watch a game on TV to go into a live game. I always look for a replay when I see something. My instinct, like, okay, I need to see that again. But it's like, you can't yeah. at a live game. It's that you're just yeah. waiting for something special, aren't you? Yeah, and and and, that, and that's it for me. The, the the joy of football because the, those talking points, the goals, the sendings off, the close yeah. chances, the the decisions by a manager who's, who's made a silly substitution or a great substitution, mm-hmm. they're the talking points that we have in the pub, and they're the talking points that we that get talked about on match of the day or the championship show or, or something else, and and that's what we live for, you know what I mean? Because at the minute you can watch a goal and re- rewind it ten times and watch it over again, and and yeah. then by the time you know what I mean and watch those VAR decisions and and watch them close knit instead of being there waiting and being excited, you know straight away what the decision's going to be because you know. It's offside because you've seen that you've seen the, the 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 freeze frames and things and and i think it just takes away a little bit of uh of that excitement and the edge because and the unknown because when you're when you're there you can't hear the ref um you can't see the tv cameras you're just waiting for the decision on the scoreboard and and i think when you watch it on tv sometimes it, it can be a little bit of a letdown it can be as a um as a former player what difference does the crowd make to you? Having a full crowd there behind you, cheering you, what difference does that make to you when you're out there playing? I think I think if that well, it can it can go two ways really. I think it can spur you on. It can 
it can get your adrenaline going, but also it can put you into into a shell. It depends on where you're playing. There's, there's been some hostile places I've played. Millwall, for example, is a hostile place, but if you let it get to you, it can affect your performance. But you know, what I mean, if it, it, I thrived on playing in front of people, I used to hate pre-season games when there was hardly any people there. I used to hate when I um, uh, when I played reserve games, coming back from injury because you're playing in front of empty stadiums, and it was it was hard to motivate yourself sometimes when you when you when there's nobody there. So credit to these players who are who are motivating themselves and managers who are motivating the players to play in front of empty stadiums because for me fans played a massive part in, in getting me going for for warming up um you can feel the buzz and, and when you walk out in front of uh in front of a crowd at, at five to three but with the referee in front of you is just the best feeling ever and and listening to that noise when you score a goal and you know what i mean it must i don't know I, until i've sampled it and scored a goal with no fans then I, I can't compare but i'm guessing it would not come anywhere near close to the feeling when you when you hear Five, ten, twenty, thirty, eighty thousand fans. You know what I mean? It would just be very, very different. And the fact you're doing it for your hometown club as well. That's got to put a little bit of extra sugar on the top, hasn't it? Ah, uh, yeah, massively. You know what I mean? I was, I was so lucky that I left school at uh, sixteen year old and uh, and walked straight into a uh, my hometown club at Middlesbrough. And you know what I mean? That and that club at the time were going places. Brian Robson had just taken over as manager, and Steve Gibson and. I promised him the world, and well, I didn't just promise him; he gave him the world, and 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 backed him as well. And um, I was lucky enough to uh, to make my debut as a sixteen-year-old in front of my family, friends, um, ex-schoolmates. Uh, you know, I've been playing with all these world-class footballers, and then yeah, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. And, uh, and then to carry on and seeing these world-class footballers walk through the revolving door uh, was just a, an amazing thing. You know, that that Man United's best came through one year, and then. Champions League's best walking through the next, and it was just a brilliant, brilliant feeling, and, and just got better and better every year. And even the even the heartache of two cup final defeats and relegation didn't squash it for me because it just made my appetite and wanted to get that great football club back to the Premier League the next season even stronger. And thankfully, we did that and and kicked on a little bit. And even when I left, um, you know what I mean, that that the football club evolved a little bit. Steve McLaren took over and brought his own players, own ideas in it. I was still a football fan and still a Middlesbrough fan, and, and still am to this day. And, and they're the first, you know, I mean, the first team I look for, and just so so happy to see them uh, get the first silverware and get to a European Cup final. Uh, you know what I mean? And 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 I'm gutted the position they're in at the minute, but I'm sure that that they'll get back to somewhere where the where where we all want them to be very shortly, hopefully. It's such a competitive league as well that you are in, isn't it? Like yeah, just because you are there now, yeah, like it's it's very very tight. But yeah, well, yeah. That's what we love about I do have a tweet for you, actually. Um, one of our followers sent a little tweet in, and I promised I'd put it up. It's from Mr. Middlesbrough, and he said, Ask him if he still got the bruise on his shin when he scored against Man United. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I have to be fair. Um, I, I, it, to be fair, I, um, I've got uh, that's obviously the goal against Man United, what rolled down my shin and the ball. It well, I, I, it was a clean, clean volley, you know what I mean? I yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. a clean volley, but. Uh, or it could have been uh, it could have been the black eye when uh, when I scored my header because I shut my eyes again for that goal. I, I never I never <laughs> used my header. It was the worst header of the ball ever in, in professional football. So um, you know what I mean. For me, to score a goal from my hometown club is one thing, but to score against Man United once, not never mind twice, was just you know what I mean. It, it wasn't. And to be fair, the Man United teams back in the day as well, they were. They were something else and more. You know, the, the two goalkeepers I scored against, uh, Mark Bosic uh, was my shin roller, and then. Um, um, Fabian Barthez World Cup winner you know what I mean so you know what I mean to score to score against anybody's great but to score against two goalkeepers of that calibre is just is just uh, surreal at times you know what I mean? and Back you to took Man United out of the player. FA Cup if I remember rightly did that, that yeah, we, up, didn't it? Yeah. yeah we did yeah the header yeah that was a 2-0 win yeah when Steve McLaren was manager and uh, obviously they, they, I think we played that game early because uh, they uh, they were going to Brazil for that World Club Cup whatever it is nowadays mm -hmm. called and um, and they had a really strong side out they had a you know, what I mean, Lauren Blanc, um, Fabian Barthez, Phil Neville, Gary Neville. Yeah, I mean, they were really, really strong. They had a they had a good side out, but you know, what I mean, the longer the game went, we had an opportunity to to beat them, and, and it, that was our day. You know, what I mean, if we hadn't beaten them, we 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 would have would have gone to a replay at Old Trafford, and we probably wouldn't have stood a chance. So our, our day, it was our day, and it was supposed supposed to be the end. So it was a fantastic achievement for us as a club at the time. It was a real strong period for Middlesbrough, wasn't it? I remember the Brian Robson era really well, and. Recently, Superstar Speakers, we did a Middlesbrough show at the Middlesbrough Theatre. We had Robson and Clayton and Pallister all together. And you yeah. can still feel in the city of Middlesbrough the love that they have 
for that era and that great time when you've got your Robson coming in and he's bringing in Janino, Ravinelli, Emerson, etc. Yeah. Um, what's your memories of Robson? Because obviously your boyhood club, you've seen them in yeah. the low. Robson comes in and this this yeah. whole fanfare that came with it. What's your memories mm. of that period? If uh, I, th I think at the time, obviously they were in a bit of a, a bit of a doldrums, and obviously we, we we didn't have a manager at the time. So when the when the when the chairman obviously announced Brian Robson to come in, you know what I mean, and he, and he brought in uh, Clayton Blackmore with him. He he, he brought in Nigel Pearson, Neil Cox, million pound signing, Alan Miller in goal. You know what I mean. He, um, later on, he brought Jan Fjortoff in, and he had a nucleus of the team anyway with the Curtis Flemings and uh, Robbie Musto, Steve Vickers, um, etc. With 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 a few good young players all coming through, um, and. You know what I mean? The excitement of the supporters, you know what I mean? Because Brian Robson still played. He was the best player at training, yeah. best player on the pitch during the games. You know what I mean? Clayton had so much experience and quality coming through. You know what I mean? Those lads, they just won the Premier League. You know what I mean? So, And then and then they're coming down and dropping down the league into, into the Championship. So, you know what I mean? It was, it's always going to be a tough, a, a, a tough league. And You know what I mean? But but the training methods, the high standards, what they had, Viv Anderson, Gordon McQueen, you know what I mean? He, he brought in the right people at the right time and, and if it wasn't for those um, signings, backroom players, the manager bringing in uh, himself and, and 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 stuff, that the football club wouldn't be where it is now. And you know what I mean. And fans don't forget. And you know what I mean. And, and the history will never be forgotten because for me, that's the time when when the football club evolved and turned and changed as a as a top club. Because if we didn't have Brian Robson coming in, we didn't get promoted, we wouldn't have had the the new stadium as 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 strong as it was and as full as it was and as excited as it was because the town was going places and it's all down to the appointment of Brian Robson. Absolutely. Do you know what? That um, brings me to a point that I was going to bring up later on, but you say the football and the town going places were linked. Um, mm. with the, the attitude of the people changes when the football's working, doesn't yeah. it? Certainly up there. Yeah, yeah. Um, totally agree. I want to ask you about the proposal of the Newcastle takeover because obviously the northeast is its own little world of football but yeah. what do you think of what the Newcastle takeover will be like for the city of Newcastle will be like for the northeast and just be like for that club um first and foremost I think you know what I mean I think the football club does need to go in a different direction I think Mike actually has has, has taken that football club as far as he can you know I think um Rightly or wrongly, good or bad, however you want to look at the, the the job he's done, you know what I mean. He's a businessman and he's and he's invested in the club, not as much as fans wanted him to do, but he's he's done what he wanted to do, and 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 in his in his times now he's done for me. And if this takeover takes place, I think they could be a force to be reckoned with. You know what I mean? Their, their fans are absolutely crazy. The the, the travelling numbers, the turn up, good, bad, ugly. Um, in fifty two thousand week in week out, and they're absolutely passionate. You know what I mean? And and the North East is just an amazing place to support because Sunderland's strong, Middlesbrough strong, Newcastle strong. But I want everything in the North East to get back. As I want Sunderland to get back in the Premier League via the Championship. Well, Middlesbrough to push up, Newcastle to push up, and it'll just be great. And you know what I mean? Obviously, Newcastle have got an opportunity here to uh, to catch the likes of Man City because obviously the, it's going to be if if it does take over and it does end up going through, he's going to be the richest football owner around so you know what I mean yeah. rules and, and, and money's going to be no object and um, you know what I mean they've got a, a, a brilliant ground brilliant training ground everything's in place in that football club for the for the club to go places but they need they need it to get sealed signed and delivered they need all this to calm down and then they need to, to, to structure in and bring in the right footballers and if that's a new manager and Steve Bruce loses his job I hope not because I've played for Steve and I know how good he is but you know with, with this kind of takeover normally he brings in a a world class manager, and you know what I mean. Unfortunately, then a couple of people end up losing their jobs. But you know what I mean. I'm a I'm a Middlesbrough fan, but I still want the teams in the northeast to be in the top league. I want derbies. I, I love the derby. I, I sample the derby as a player, as a fan, and and I want that again because it's you know I mean, it doesn't happen enough. And you know what I mean. I I, I I need those kind of games back in as a football fan. Do you know what my? I mean, you may have noticed if you look in the background there. I'm a Newcastle fan yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, what the thing that gets me is if this gets taken over pretty sharpish, the boys that are there already are going to raise their game because they're going to want to keep their yeah. jobs. And they're going to want pay yeah. rises. So that's one thing. The next round of the FA Cup, we've got Man City. Now, that's mm. a very different game when you've got a billionaire owner, isn't it? Like in a yeah. couple of weeks' time. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. And the thing is, though, yeah, money talks, and you know what I mean? Players, you know what I mean? The players who are there will have to raise the game because they know that. Uh, not that they're going to be unemployed, but they, they won't play games as much. And you, you know, what I mean, you know, as a player, you need to play. You, you need to raise your profile. You need to play games. And if you're not playing, you end up moving clubs, probably to a lesser club. 
if you want to be part of the Newcastle journey, you've got to raise your raise your performances and score more goals, keep more clean sheets, win more tackles, for example, as a midfielder. And uh, and you know, I mean, Newcastle will be an exciting time for a for a for a football fan in my mind, a Newcastle fan, because we all know the excitement when Roman Abramovich took over at Chelsea. We all know the excitement when uh, when Man City owners took over, uh, even Man United owners and Liverpool owners to a certain degree. Um, that we want the best players playing in the Premier League and. You know, what I mean, I, I'm not bothered where they go as long as as long as they come to England because you know, what I mean, Paris Saint Germain they took some world class players. You know, what I mean, Italy have taken some world class players. Spain are taking some world class players. And instead of having them spread around, I want I want them where I can see them week in week out or go and see them live. And you know, what I mean, and if we can do that and 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 attract more people, then so be it. That's the best place to be because it'll make it even more competitive for me. Absolutely, and everyone wins, don't they? Every like you go yeah. like. Teams in the Champions League start to yeah. raise a bit of awareness, which brings it back home to not just the Premier League, but the lower leagues as well, doesn't it? it yeah. That whole umbrella, there's a whole yeah. trickle down of it, isn't there? Yeah, but I also see it as a national team as well, because if, if young English players are training with better world-class footballers, they're going to become better players. Yes, the game, um, the time on the pitch, that team might be might be limited a little bit, but they can go and get experience that like that on uh, on loan, you know what I mean? Because they're going to become better players because they're training every single day and every single minute of a training session with better footballers. So it's going to only, it can only have a positive impact. And, you know, I don't see, I don't see many negatives of it. You know what I mean? People say, you know what I mean? Foreigner this, foreigner that. But that's just the way that the Premier League's moved and, and gone on. And, you know what I mean? The, the best players, if we picked a, a Premier League 11, the majority of the players will be foreign players. So, you know, we can't, we can't have that. As a, as a plus, and then start slagging off Newcastle for for getting an owner. You know what I mean? Because these 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 football fans who are against Newcastle getting getting taken over, uh, Man City fans, foreign owner, Chelsea fans, foreign owner, Liverpool fans, foreign owner, Man United fans, foreign owner. So I don't I don't see a, a negative in it because it's only going to make the Premier League even more competitive and um, and and make the top six a top eight. You know what I mean? So it'll, it's going to make it even more interesting because then Premier League places come up for grabs and it, it can be one of six, seven and eight. So for me, it's only a good thing. Well, if you're a neutral as well, you're seeing bigger games and yeah. more champions. It's not like the old days where it was either Man United or Arsenal were going to win it. It would be, I genuinely yeah. don't know who's going to win this. Yeah, and every game, every every live game on TV, if you if you're not fortunate enough to go to a game, there's world class players on the pitch. Instead of it being a, a bog standard Sunday game where you're thinking, oh, they could have had a different game on, but every game is going to be littered with better players because it's you know what I mean. It's also going to filter players down, so it's going to it's going to make it even better and even stronger. So I just don't see it. I don't see a negative in it. I want uh, I want better players continue coming to the Premier League because you just we're greedy, we're greedy, aren't we? Because we we've been. Inundated with with good footballers years gone by, you know what I mean. We've got that. You look at the Zolas, the Van Nistelrooy's, the Patrick Vieira's, just to name a few, mm -hmm. three different clubs, and, and even Newcastle with, with, with Ginola, Les Ferdinands, Philip Albert. You know what I mean. We want Newcastle want those times back, and you know what I mean. They had an unbelievable manager in, in, in King Kevin. Um, you know what I mean. And down the road at Sunderland, they had um, Nell Quinn, Kevin Phillips. They want those times back. Middlesbrough, Ravenelli. You know what I mean. These are all world class probably foreign players so you know what I mean that, that I would have no qualms in if Steve Steve Gibson sold Middlesbrough to a, a foreign investor who, who ploughed money into it because it was going to make the football club stronger and better so I can't have that and then slag somebody else off for doing doing the same thing because it's just not at all and it's not work. even a new thing is it like in your time at Middlesbrough we said Janino, Emerson, Ravinelli coming in and that was yeah. you know with the greatest respect in the world that's 20 plus years back like it's yeah. not a new mentality to have a foreign influence and for yourself when you're training with these guys what was that like for you to train with Ravenelli who just won the Champions League with Emerson with Janino like even well Brian Robson as well if you want but like what was it like to train with these world-class footballers yeah well I, I look I look for my day one when I walked in that football club that um centre forward you know what I mean we were doing shooting practice with uh, Jan Fjortov foreigner came over um Ravinelli, Janino, Boxic, you know what I mean, uh, Mikel Beck, all yeah. these players have come over from different countries, you know what I mean, so I I learned so much from those kind of players, so I, I, I adapted my game accordingly, I learned things from all these kind of players and different traits from, from certain individuals and I was thankful enough that that I had the opportunity to learn from those kind of players. But if they didn't walk through the door and 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 the Premier League wasn't as big and strong and money wasn't there, then I wouldn't have had that opportunity to play, learn and and watch these kind of players. So I'm so thankful that the Premier League has took off as a business because it would have hampered my um, progression potentially. Yes, I might have played more games, but I, I don't think I would have been a better player um, because I wouldn't have been able to watch these kind of players. Or arguably, 
had the cup runs and the successes that the club had? Uh, well, I don't think Middlesbrough would have had success at all. I, I, I believe it would have been a, a huge struggle. Uh, I believe, you know what I mean, there, there was bigger and better sides in, in the Championship at that time. You know what I mean, we, we, we just got over the line with, with, with Brian Robson going in there, you know what I mean, with all the players that he brought in and, and we'd, 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 we'd spent massive in that, in that league. So, um, you know, I mean, it probably wouldn't have happened. You know, what I mean, so yes, you've got to take the risk sometimes and, and splash the cash. And, and the teams who, who spend a lot of money in the championship normally get out of the league. And um, sometimes it's a risk because if you don't get promoted, spending that kind of money, you know, what I mean, it, it can have a financial imp implications on on your future. But if you do get promoted, it's, it's a fantastic investment. And mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, sometimes teams have to take that risk. You know, I mean, Newcastle when they got relegated, they, they ploughed the money in and, and they continue to do it with the Premier League money. The, the sign is what they made, White Gale, etc. Joy Barton, you know. So you know, they, they, they continue to do it. So for me, it's it's an investment. It's not a and it's a big risk, but it's an invest, investment, hoping that you do achieve that holy grail. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I'm going to um, move away a little bit from financial and back to your time at Middlesbrough um, because obviously I'm going to talk about Paul Merson and Paul Gascoigne, um, two guys yeah. you were... Did you see Merson on Harry's Heroes recently? Did I did, you... yeah. Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. He's, yeah, he's, yeah. I, I know, obviously, Merce had his, uh, had his his issues at Arsenal before he came to Middlesbrough. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, we were fully, fully aware of, uh, of of obviously, this, his, his own personal, personal problems and, and things and... Um, but those aside, as a footballer, absolute genius, you know, yeah. just uh, yeah, absolute, absolute genius. His, 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 his ability as a footballer, never in question, you know, that how far and how, how, how much more he could have achieved in the game if, if he didn't have those kind of issues. It would have, would have, could have been really scary, really. Because, and same as Gaza, you know, that, you know, what I mean, same thing. And I think it was just, it was such a, probably such a, such a sad thing to say, but it's, in this generation and in this, and this lifestyle that, the players have now. Um, imagine how much more we could have got out of a Paul Merson or a, or a Paul Gascoigne because you know oh, I mean right. those two ability alone were just out of this world and um, you know. But back then there was no um, no social media, no no phones to get people into trouble to keep them out of the pub and and keep them on the straight and narrow. Unfortunately, and you know what I mean. And 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 yeah, the, back back then it was the social side and you know what I mean the things that I sampled the social side were absolutely fantastic because it. You grow up from a young lad into a into a man very quickly, but um, and, and the memories you have and the laughs you have are great. But you know, what I mean, it, it, it can have a, a negative impact on your career at times because it, you know, what I mean, it's not a healthy way of a, a lifestyle, unfortunately. But you know, what I mean, it's it's, uh, it's it's it was a fun, it was a it was it was, it was a fun time to be around uh, around those kind of players. Though. I can imagine. Um, I, I was going to lead on to the um, the point of a lot of the trouble that Merson's had that was mentioned in Harry's Heroes was the the retiring from football and how that just when you hang up your boots, it's a very yeah. difficult process. And we've asked a few of our guests about this. What's your take on it? Because from talking to you now, Andy, you seem like you've um, adapted to it like a duck to water and you seem quite calm and settled with it. Um, well, 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 I wasn't. I'll be honest. I, I'm not sure that, that the football authorities do enough. I'll be honest. I, I really struggled when I came out the game. I I, um, I came out the game uh, around 30, 32, 33, and and I was lost. I was I was so lost for so many, so many days, and um, you know what I mean. I had, I had so many bad thoughts, so many bad things. Because one minute you 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 you're classed as a for professional footballer, you you you're classed as high, high, high regard, and you and you're earning money. And then the next minute you you're a nothing, a nobody, so to speak, and not not earning a penny. And I, I found that as a as a real struggle because I didn't know where to look. I didn't know what my options were. Nobody had ever sat down with me and um and told me what my what my future held. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think everybody thinks that you that you're going to play football and uh, and it's going to last forever. That you're going to earn enough money that you that you don't have to ever work again. And well, unfortunately, that's not the case. You know what I mean? That, that you play football in a generation that. Uh, that money didn't grow on trees at the time when I played. You know what I mean? Yes, we were well paid, um, uh, but you obviously lifestyle. Um, you had a lifestyle to go with that. Um, and you know, I mean, when I when I came up the game, I was I was lost for probably six months to a year, and uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, I got I got thrown into uh, a conversation with the PFA, um, uh, Andy Barlow and Richard Jobson in particular, um, ex Oldham and ex Man City players, and uh, and and I think if it wasn't for those two, uh, I'm not sure where my future would have been and uh, and you know what I mean because those two had a massive impact on uh, on on the on the way that I then looked at my future and, and things because I left football I joined football sorry with no qualifications I left school with nothing 
uh, mm-hmm. because my only dream and my only aspiration was to go and play football. So um, they told me to go and do my GCSEs. So I went and did my GCSEs. I, I, I did a night class, uh, a 33-year-old with, uh, with with quite an older clientele as well. So I was in a similar boat. But then then they told me to go to university, which I went with 18, 18 19, 20-year-olds like you, like you do. And I'm a 33, 34-year-old, 35-year-old person doing a three-year three year degree, a sports science degree. And um, I didn't do all the socialising what all those youngsters did, but I was there to do a job, and and, and I think my football then, my, fo- my, my, my football, and my pre- professionalism um, stuck me into a, a routine of work nine to five, do all my work, get it all done. I can enjoy my weekends with my family, and my kids, and um, and and then go back to it on the Monday and get my course done, and then and then look for what I want to do because you know what I mean. I knew that I was going to have to work, but I was lucky enough that um, that. Uh, I was able to do a course and, and get a qualification behind me. But I'll be honest, if it wasn't for the PFA and, and somehow falling falling onto that, um, I just wish it had happened probably a year earlier because I, I do feel as though I'd, I'd lost a year and some of the thoughts that I was having were really not very nice thoughts. And um, and, and obviously I was I was just very, very lost and, and lost all my confidence a little bit that, you know what I mean, that I just didn't know where my, where my life was going to go. And, you know what I mean, thankfully that uh, I'm now a, now a teacher uh, in primary school and you know what I mean I, and I couldn't have done that with, with loads of help and support really because you know what I mean As a, I think as a player I think you're in this bubble where I think you think it's going to last forever and, you, and I think you, you you believe you're going to stay in football for the rest of your life and uh, and sometimes you decide not to because you, you fall out of love with football but I don't think that was the case for me I was just um, I think sometimes you didn't get an opportunity to progress on to be a, a coach or a manager or, or things at the time that it's just, it's just sometimes it's, you go down a different avenue than to to come back into football or talk about football and then, and then to do stuff. So it's, you know I mean? It's, you know, I love what I'm doing now. You know what I mean? Love, love, love the job I do and love talking about football. So it's, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm so passionate about football that, that I love talking about all football, current football, professional football, semi-professional football players. It's just, it's just so nice to be able to, to do something that I, that I love. That's a, my, firstly, thank you very much for sharing that with us. That's great. Secondly, could I tip my hat to you because that's a hell of an achievement and you said it like it was nonchalant, but Fair play to you, mate. Take some credit for that one. Um, and thirdly, what do you think the PFA could do better then for younger players? Obviously, younger players are earning a lot more money now, yeah. so that yeah. and I believe a lot of clubs give them financial advisors. But yeah. from your point of view, what do you think a, gr- a positive change would be? Um, well, I'm, 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 this isn't me slagging the PFA off. I, th- I just think maybe it's a, a, a somewhat, a, 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 maybe it's a, a company run by ex-players could be set up to help and go into um, clubs, uh, apprentices, uh, maybe it's young pros, maybe it's experienced pros, or sit down with with people who are interested in a conversation of um, what happens when you do leave. You know what I mean? Because nobody knows that feeling of leaving professional football until you've done it, and thousands and thousands and thousands of people have done it. But they've all got a different story. And I think the success stories are brilliant. Don't get me wrong. They're absolutely fantastic. But I think people need to hear um, a range of stories of good and bad because it's, um, it affects people in different ways. And, and if you know, if it could be an injury. It could be uh, a bit of luck. It could be uh, not getting a contract. It could be not it could be an agent it could be anything a whole host of reasons why you don't stay in football but i think you need to be ready for that moment because um money also doesn't last forever because you live in a lifestyle even if you're getting paid a hundred thousand pounds a week your lifestyle is probably uh used to that kind of la- that kind of that, that kind of world and you know what i mean then you're draining it that money every week every month and you're, you're going on these flash holidays buying all these flash cars you know, still living that kind of lifestyle, and then all of a sudden, it, one day it will drain. It will drain, and if that's not carefully managed by yourself, by somebody else, or or or, or invested in certain things, and um, you know what I mean, and 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 or, or something else um, is added onto it, then it's going to have an impact on kids, grandkids, and, and future generations. And you know what I mean. Unfortunately, I think I think somebody's got a, a duty of care. You know what I mean? Because I don't, I don't always think that clubs do that because. Clubs are uh, quite selfish. Clubs are in it for themselves because it's very rare that a, a player will start at a club and finish at the same club. So, and they'll probably they'll probably work for that club for for the rest of their life because they, you've got that affiliation. But once you leave a club, you know what I mean. That that they that sometimes you disregard them, they disregard you. So it's you know what I mean. Sometimes the duty of care has got to be done by somebody, and I'm just not sure who that's with. And and hopefully it, it, somebody can can just go on in and, and just casually talk to people, you know, that I, I'm doing a, I'm doing a talk tomorrow with some, some young, young scholars um, over a, 
I think it's over Zoom and like a webinar sort of just to telling people about that transition and the transition yeah. I just spoke about. And hopefully um, if those kids don't make it to professional football and, and, uh, and they need to fall back on something that, that they know that, that there is an avenue for them. It's not, it's not all, they're not lost. They're not, they're not, the life's not over. You know what I mean? There's, there's a, there's another life without football. And, and until someone shows you it or, or pushes you down a, down a, a that, that alley that you, that, that, that you never know. You know what I mean, but I will tell you about what. Yeah, I, I think I just like to, like somebody. You know what I mean. I, I'd I'd love to do it. I'd love to to go into clubs and uh, and talk to people about it because you know what I mean. It's not all doom and gloom as well, by the way. You know what I mean. The the, the, the it could have it could have ended differently for me. Um, you know what I mean. You listen to Lee Hendry's story and um, oh, heartbreaking. You know that. Yeah, it is, and it's not it's not nice. But there's you know what I mean. The, the, these are real life real life events and real life stories because you. Uh, because also you, you see the, the 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 good stories and the positive stories, but you also need to hear the the not so nice things as well because it's uh, it's 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 real life and football's real life. It's not soap. It's yeah. not it's not lived out for you. You got to live it yourself. I always say this about football because I'm fortunate enough that in this job I get to meet a lot of you former players. And the one thing that always strikes me when people say like, "Oh, what's it like meeting so and so? What's it like meeting so and so?" I say all footballers have predominantly the same story. Young lad, working class, decent at football, got a bit of luck, got signed up. And it's it's essentially the same as the people that are sat in the crowds watching it, all just working class lads that love football. You yeah. guys are the ones that that made it that way. Um, so, yeah, when you come out at 42 and that's all you've done, it's got to be heart-wrenching. I'm very interested in how you got into this... Um, this talk, this seminar that you're doing, actually, because that sounds like a really positive thing that more people can benefit from. Uh, it was just I got messaged uh, by uh, just by a, a friend of mine who's who's taken over a, a youth academy and and he wants his players to to sample conversations with current players. I think George Friend was on last week from Middlesbrough, uh, left back, their captain, uh, and he just wants a, a different, just a different view on 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 how I see uh, professional football now. My uh, my journey as a as a player, my journey, my journey out of football, my journey in from football, and you know what I mean. Everyone's got a different story to tell, and that's the that's the um, uh, just the joy of it. You know what I mean? I know the guests that we've had on our podcast. That you know what I mean? I'm, I sometimes sit there and 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 sometimes I just look at I look at I look at my look at my screen, and I can be sitting there with my mouth open because I'm just so enthralled in, in what they're saying because I didn't know half the stuff what they're saying, and you know what I mean. And, and they were my teammates, some of them, and I'm just thinking. I never knew that about you. You know what I mean. So how, how is anyone else going to know it? Because people, footballers are very private, mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes it only takes, and sometimes the story never comes out until sometimes it's too late. You know what I mean? I lost a good friend of mine and a and a uh, an ex teammate of mine, Chris Barker, who, who committed suicide um, this year. And you know what I mean? And and I think sometimes, well, certainly for me, I think the story that I've that I tell it and I tell now uh, probably kept a little bit to myself because. I think I was thought it was very private, but I think if it helps somebody, um, I think it, ca it can't do any harm because I'm not embarrassed of it. Um, certainly, that's that's one thing that I, I will say to anybody. You know what I mean? Because I I, I would never portray myself to be a, a good footballer. I worked harder than a lot of people did uh, because I knew I didn't have the skills and the ability what people had. I had something that I knew nobody had, and the pace what I had frightened the life and the death out of everybody. Um, and that I use that to my advantage. And um, but. I knew when it came to the the, the the fitness side, the long distance running, I was always at the back. I was always getting abused by the manager. You know what I mean? That I wasn't fit enough. But I just wasn't built like that. And you know what I mean? I wasn't the, the strongest. You know what I mean? So I was always getting pushed off the ball. But a ball over the top, I would beat anybody in a race. You know what I mean? He, he, people say about uh, about uh, about players now, you know what I mean? Michael Owens, the Cristiano Ronaldo's, you know what I mean? I would, the Adama Triores. I would have backed myself when I played to beat anybody in a leg race. You know what I mean, and and you know what I mean, and and even still now, part of me when I when I do play for the over forties, that I think I'm I think I'm quick, but I'm not. I've lost it. I'm, I'm a little bit quicker <laughs> than some people, but uh, it, it, you know what I mean. I just love football that much that I just think things. Sometimes I forget. I forget where I am, but you put your boots on, you forget. But it's uh, no, you know what I mean. It's but it's such a it's such a talking point, and you know what I mean. If I can help certain people, young people, older people, and uh, that transition in, in football out of football, you know what I mean, and and help them on a a different journey or give them advice or, or something. I say my, my messages are always open on social media and I, and I say that and I say it in my podcast because, you know what I mean, it's, and that's people who, who are in football as well because, you know what I mean, everyone's, everyone has bad thoughts and especially at the time we're in now that it's such a, uh, 
a, a, such a surreal moment in life that you know we were all we were all we all have our days hours weeks that we just we just don't know what to do with ourselves but you know mm -hmm. i mean hopefully hopefully uh, some kind of a text or a message or or just a a, a, a wish to to, to cheat, cheer or cheer somebody up can 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 go a thousand miles sometimes I think you're absolutely right. There's a wonderful movement in the world that I, I credit to Frank Bruno starting that men's mental health is no longer a stigma to what it was um, yeah. 25, 30 years ago. The men are actually now able to talk about it, which I think yeah. is a fantastic thing. And people should never be frightened of doing it. And no. if you save one person's life or you make one person start the conversation rolling, then you've done a good job. And again, credit to you because you sound like you've got all your, um, all your ducks in a row. Um, yeah. We do have a question from Matthew Roberts, and he said, Andy, Cardiff City fans will always remember that winner versus QPR. What a finish. How good did it feel to do that at the Millennium Stadium? Oh, do you know what? I, I, I probably I don't have any regrets from football, but I've got one wish. And my one wish was that I never got to play at Wembley. I was 17th man twice to, at Wembley under Middlesbrough uh, for the Cup Finals, and he always wanted to play at Wembley. Uh, but to play for Cardiff in the Millennium Stadium in a, in a playoff final, you know, I'd, I'd never, never, ever, ever um, turn that away because it's just it, the whole day. You know, what I mean, I, watching watching the fans queuing up, um, cheering the bus into the stadium, and the, the whole atmosphere of warming up to the game. The game was awful, by the way. The game was just it was, it was, it was a it was probably one of the worst playoff finals I think I've ever witnessed. You know what I mean? Because the, normally playoff finals are quite interesting, and there's a few goals and. You know, the game was awful. Nil-nil, extra time, nil-nil, five minutes to go, boring. It was just penalties written all over it. And then and then I remember I remember just looking at the looking at the looking at the clock uh, and thinking five minutes to go and thinking, where am I gonna put my penalty? Where am I gonna put my penalty? The pressure on penalty takers, I'm gonna have to be one, by the way, that this is gonna be I can't afford to miss. Where am I gonna do? I'm gonna have to put my foot through it. Um and then you know what I mean, and the ball got put over the top by Gareth Wally and um and yeah, like I said, nobody was going to beat me in a leg race. You know, what I mean, that was one thing I had in my locker. And uh, Clark Carlisle, Danny Shitu with the two centre halves that day, and um, and I managed. The ball was just just looped over the top, and I managed to get a really good connection on the volley. And Chris Day just it was it was inches to be fair from, from from getting a touch. And when that ball hit the net, you know, what I mean, the noise at the Millennium Stadium, roof open, roof closed. I've been to the stadium hundreds of times and in the noise in that stadium is just is, is scary and it was just a, a wall of noise and I just couldn't believe it and I didn't know where to look and then I remembered that my family were was just in the far corner so celebrating right near them and, and I promised to do a celebration for one of, my, one of my friends who wasn't so but he asked me to do a celebration but it was my roommate the night before Gethin Jones who, who told me to do a chin up celebration to him so I managed to do that to him um, and then everyone jumped on top of me I, I just and I remember just the next four minutes of the game were just just a wipeout, you know. I, I watched the game after, uh, so many times after. I didn't touch the ball. I was running around like a headless chicken, and I was just hoping that they didn't score because I didn't want to take a penalty. I was so frightened that um, just the success that we could have had was going to be get, going to get taken away. And then when that final whistle went, the the joy, um, the exterior, the noise again was just it was just unbelievable. And people asked the question about what was it like in the changing room after. And you know what? It was just. It was so surreal, so quiet, because I think we we took everything and left everything outside that when we went in that we were we were sat in the showers, sat in the sat in the baths and yes, we were drinking, we were socialising, we were having a uh, re realizing or trying to understand what we just achieved, but at the same time it was it was it was probably so placid and so calmer than it was outside in, in the city, outside in the stadium and you know what I mean? it was only when we left the stadium with our family to go into the city to do uh, um, uh, uh, things that we had to do for sponsors and things, and 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 and, and meet family. That I realised then how what we'd achieved because that was that was crazy. That was just the the maddest moment. You know what I mean? I'm talking about going over a a road which took four hours to get over a road. You know what I mean? It was just you know, I mean getting mobbed was is an understatement. You know what I mean? That the exterior, the fans. You know what I mean? It was just you couldn't go anywhere without uh, without the joy, and that probably lasted till about. Thursday and that was a Sunday you know so you know what I mean it was it, yeah I didn't spend much time at home or in bed that 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 weekend or week so it was uh it was nice to to chill out for a couple of days to, to, towards the end of the week that's brilliant I'm very interested actually what's the um what's the mentality like going into a playoff final because like are you there confident you've got this and we're gonna win it and it's a matter of time or is there a seed of doubt in there like what's your mind space like going into a playoff final 
Well, we'd, well, going into the playoffs, we uh, we missed out on promotion, so uh, we went into the playoffs probably quite negative. We we, we went and under underperforming. We'd we'd taken a few heavy defeats, and and then we played Bristol City over two legs, and again two poor games, two clean sheets though, beat them one nil over over the, the course of two games, um, and then went into the QPR game, really confident because we played QPR a month before uh, at Loftus Road, and we beat them four nil. Uh, Robert Earnshaw scored a hat trick and I and I scored the fourth goal. Came on a sub, and so I was going into the game pretty confident, thinking it was going to be an easy game because I was confident that Ernie was going to run riot again and um, and nobody was going to be able to touch him. But the longer the game was going, you know what I mean? They were coming into the game a little bit. They were they were they were they were squashing our our better players, so so called better players on the on the day, and and the confidence was zapping. But the longer the game went, you know what I mean? I think it had penalties written all over it, and it was only going to be something special. Um, to do it and, and to be able to to be that person to be able to do it but you know what I mean I think we were really confident going into the game um, but I think we were also very nervous because I think the implications if we if we had lost in the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff it wasn't worth it talking about you know what I mean I remember a couple of days before we, we sat down as a group of players with a, with a captain Graham Kavanagh and he explained to us that Listen, he said. Listen, boys. He said. Um, he said it's it's mustn't lose. You know. He said performance goes out the window a little bit in the playoffs. You know. What I mean, we'd all we'd all um, been beaten in the playoffs the season before in the semi final against Stoke City, and it was horrible feeling. And um, so we knew what it was like to lose. So we we knew that by hook or by crook we had to get there. And you know, what I mean, I think we just got over the line a little bit. You know, what I mean, because I, I, nobody probably deserved to lose the game on the on the day. So you know, what I mean, it's probably probably a fair result would have been a draw. You know, what I mean, but. Thankfully for us, because penalties would have been horrific for everybody, for them and for us, and for fans, for players, for for managers, for the, for the losing team. You know what I mean? Yes, somebody had to lose anyway, but you know what I mean. To lose on penalties is there's no worse way to go. But you know what I mean? Thankfully, we we managed to get the victory on the day. Just interesting. Thank you. Mark has a little. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement, but he says I spent two fantastic years in Middlesbrough, and I'm yet to find a post beer or boxing feast better than Chicken Palmer. Do you agree? And can he give a shout out to John Pierce Senior and Junior and John Dryden and everyone at the Wellington ABA? So Chicken Palmer, Andy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's a delicacy in uh, in the northeast. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> bread, breaded chicken with bechamel sauce with melted cheese on top, and it's uh, it's it's every pizza shop um restaurant yeah pub you know what i mean it's it is the it is the delicacy of middlesbrough and i think it's 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 got down south i think to a couple of places i don't think it's took off as uh, as well as uh, some places w- would have liked um but no it's yeah but middlesbrough is a hothead for for that and they love the football they love the, they love the boxing um you know stewie downing is has, has brought um big boxers to middlesbrough uh, ricky hatton etc um, with 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 certain companies and you know you know it, football fans and boxing fans go the link and they go hand in hand and they're, they're the same down to earth people who who just love the sport and and just love to be entertained and and they pay good money to to do that and um, it just makes you just makes you proud to be from a certain area who, who, who's brought up in that kind of uh, 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 sport environment really and just you know what I mean it's it's, it's a really nice uh, really nice environment to be brought up in because. I love my sport. I love my rugby. I love my football. You know what I mean. I, I love any sport. As long, as long as you can go and watch it live, it just makes. I'd, I'd watch anything. But it's it's great to have it on your doorstep. I think you're absolutely right. So on the subject of boxing, then, what do you think to the Mike Tyson versus Tyson Fury exhibition that's being touted? Is it? Oh, oh to be fair, uh, uh, anything. There's a lot of rumours happening. <laughs> is it? Uh, I think uh, I'd, I'd 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 love to because you've got you've got two absolute legends of of a sport. You know that you want to. You know, every every kind of big event. You know, I mean, your pay per view events, your your your, your events at Wembley. You know, I mean, any any AJ fight, any Tyson Fury fight, any yeah. Manny Pacquiao fight, Ricky Hatton fight. You can go back to uh, all the top world class fighters. You know, what I mean, to so Frank Bruno's, Lennox Lewis, Mike Tyson. You know, what I mean, you, you want you'd love like a like a World Cup full of fighters to everyone be in the same era and just have a, a you know, what I mean, a proper Royal Rumble of of those kind of fighters and just one after another or a. You know what I mean? A short contest, like just an ex- exhibitions, and, yeah, just just something. I, I don't know how it would work because of ages and, and stuff, but, but being able to bring people back at the peak and be able to fight with somebody else would just be an unbelievable thing. You know what I mean? It's like tennis with all the all the best tennis players, football with all the best footballers. If it, it could be brought back to some kind of um, some kind of event, would just be the most surreal thing in the world because it's just. Uh, 
Uh, I hope it happens because it would it would sell out. It would just give us all an appetite of, of something to look forward to. You know, what I mean? like the like the big fights do. You know what I mean? I'm sure all the big promoters would be would jump on the back of it, and uh, Eddie Hearn would be all over it like a like a rash, and it'd just be just be unbelievable. Could you imagine the press conference with them two as well? Because they're oh. both good at like they're both very very good talkers. Yeah, they would, but it'd be a, it'd be an event in itself, wouldn't it? Because you know what I mean. Obviously, yeah. Tyson does his. Uh, he'd probably come out as, as, as another superhero and. You know what I mean? The trash talking would start, and you know what I mean. But it, it becomes an event in itself, and it sometimes when when those kind of things happen, that the boxing, uh, the fight secondary, where I don't think that would be. I think this would be. It'd be like two separate events. The the press conference would be one event. You know what I mean? And everyone watch oh, them yeah. live would pay to watch them, and then the fight would just be another an, an extra special. It'd be like the McGregor and Mayweather thing, wouldn't it? Be exactly yeah, the same all, as that. Just all over again, build. all over again. Yeah. And, and, and however people looked at it, if they thought it was fair or unfair, you know what I mean? It, it, it is what it is because it's, it's there to, to entertain. And, you know what I mean? The, 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 they are, that's what they are. They are entertainers. And, you know what I mean? Individually, so, collectively, you know what I mean? They're, they're a team, but they're, they entertain so well on, uh, on on events like that, but on on, um, on the presses or, on, on the fights, on commentaries, on on just conversations and interviews, it's just they just they just know how to handle themselves and know how to go at that extra level and and keep on making it better and make it more special. Because every fighter, you know what I mean, the press conference seems to go up another level. You know what I mean? Tyson's yeah. done it. Uh, Tyson Fury's done it so many times that he, 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 Klitschko he, he he comes in just as Batman. You know what I mean? Or, <laughs> or or gets people into the press conference and it's just it's it's just yes, it's set up, but it's just so it's well so well thought of and it just. Just makes yeah. it extra special. You know what I mean? It makes it better. There's no harm in being set up, like because it's entertaining no. and it's still tickets to the fight, doesn't it? That's entirely yeah, the point. Of course it does. Of course, I think it's all. You know what I mean? It, it's like it's like players when they walk out of football games. You know what I mean? That the music. You know, that it's an, it's an entertainment. You know what I mean? So it's, it's the same thing. It's 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 fighters walking out to a certain song, and it's it's the darts players in the Premier League walking out to a different song. Now, if you'd have told darts players Eric Bristol years ago that, that the Premier League would have happened and and he would have walked down with oh, yeah. 15, 15,000 fans, he'd have told him to shut up. You know what I mean? He's possibly one of the best English darts players ever. You know what I mean? He's missed out on all this. You know what I mean? All this fame and fortune. You know what I mean? Because Philip Howard Taylor. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's he's fell in fell in the right time. But now these these players are earning earning fortune, travelling around the world, and they're entertainers because they're it's it's a it's a it's a fantastic sport to do. Darts and pro wrestling are very similar these days. They've yeah. got characters and costumes yeah. and girls walking to the ring and everything. It's yeah. but it's a laugh, like good fun. Um, yeah. One thing you mentioned about the fantasy booking of the boxing. Did you see the Grand National this year? Because they're doing that. They yeah. did a race of all the winners over the last or the history of the national and yeah, the CGI. Did, yeah. It was great. Like yeah. I don't know if you could do that with. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, like, virtu- there, there must be somewhere. Do- it must be somewhere doing something virtually. You know what I mean? Even if it, I don't know. You know what I mean? Even if the, even if the the, the do like the punch punch bags or the other other. That's how the. I don't know, so they're not punching yeah. each other because, you know what I mean, there must be a way of doing something and thinking outside the box or, or tennis players hitting the ball to each other and and, 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 and judging how, how fast the tennis ball being hit back to them over the net or something because it's just such a... We all want to see the best people in the world doing and the best sportsmen, like running against, racing against each other, like the horse racing or, you know what I mean, or imagine that the Usain Bolt against Linford Christie like the two, you know what I mean? Oh, oh, ben yeah, Johnson's really? and, 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 you know what I mean? So those those racing in the race at the same Jesse time. Jesse Owens, go all the way back. Exactly, go all the way back. Or, you know what I mean? Boris Becker playing against um, Andy Murray, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, yeah, just, yeah, Rafa Nadal. It's just, these are the kind of things that, yeah. But I think it's just generations of sports. So these these are the kind of things that, that I was brought up on watching Wimbledon with, with my mum and dad and, and watching FA Cup finals of Coventry against Tottenham, which will never happen again because Coventry will never be in a Cup final. And You know what I mean? And these are the kind of things that um, that you never forget being brought up on. Um, just, just just the quality of sport, really. Uh, I, I've, I, this is a conversation we could have in the pub. This is great. Like The one thing about Coventry, though, that I have noticed recently, they've got, um, have you seen the Coventry away kit with the specials two-tone around it? They've done 40 years of two-tone for their away kit. Black and white ska music with a little dancing man on the back. Beautiful. I love a good football yeah. shirt. I don't know, if, don't know if you feel the yeah, same about well, that. Uh, well, I, I, I remember when I was... Uh, I'm not sure why, but I was a, I was a Crystal Palace fan because I loved the, the red, and, red and blue stripes. But also, yes. I loved the away kit at the time. And they had a, they had a fluorescent yellow 
shirt and I wore it everywhere, but I, I wore it and uh, it always attracted those horrible little flies. And you know what I mean? So I, I, had, I, had, to, I had to stop wearing it because my mum was, uh, I mean, obviously, mum was getting a little bit worried. But you know what I mean? I, so I supported a team because of the kits, because of the kit they had and the colour they had because it was different at the time. And uh, and I remember, I remember going on loan at Sheffield United um, under Steve Bruce from, uh, from Middlesbrough and, and my, my first away game. I went in a, in a little bit, a little bit blind, a little as you, as you can, as you can guess from my answer here. But uh, but Sheffield United, I remember the kit hanging up and it was fresh and yellow, and it was a red day. We were playing at all call against Sheffield United away, and I just thought to myself, oh, yellow flies. My mum, my mum will go mad if she watches me. If she watches me later, because she'll not, you know what I mean. That was that was the only thought going through my head that that my mum's not going to be happy that she's going to be watching the game and thinking about yellow flies that, that on a hot day. But you know what I mean. I was so I think I, I, I looked at the fixtures straight away after the game that. That when are we when are we playing another away game against a team in red? Because I want to wear this yellow yellow fresh shirt again because I was just I just loved it. I just loved it. It was just just something what made it more special for me. That's brilliant. I, don't, I didn't expect a great story like that. That's fantastic. No. Um, we're, we're nearly coming up to the hour. I'm just going to ask you this one question because we asked Clayton Blackmore because we tried to get Clayton Blackmore to fight John Aldridge again. Um, if you could do a white collar boxing match and if you could pick an opponent, who would it be? Oh, who would it be? Um, oh, who would it be? Um, I'd probably pick someone like really small, like Janini, or so that I'd have a little bit of a height advantage, so that I'd uh, that I might be able to get a little bit of an advantage because he's only small and I'm a little bit more, a little bit taller. So, but he'd probably beat me up anyway. So I'd say Janini. <laughs> uh, it, it, it'd sell the tickets. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> We we legitimately tried to get Keith Gillespie to fight Alan Shearer again as well. We asked him, but he was like, no. (laughs) I'd pay for that one. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said to us, he goes, whenever Alan Shearer does anything, because they play golf together now, he goes, a record Premier League goal scorer, England captain, Euro 96, golden boot. And he goes, the first thing they all ask me is, what was it like when you met Keith Gillespie? (laughs) Gillespie's like, (laughs) quality. It is good. Right, that brings up to the hour already, Andy. Um, We didn't get through the Man United team, but I really enjoyed talking to you. My pleasure, mate. Loved it. uh, Thank you very much. I wish you all the luck in the world with um, your future, your top, your work. And if you just once again, if anybody wants to listen to Andy on his podcast, please tell them where they can find that, Andy. Uh, We do uh, live on a Monday night. uh, It's Podcast Nation. It's live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. So check it out. So we've got some good guests coming up 